Our next speaker uh, is Madhumisa uh, uh, Ravi uh, Chandran, and uh, she will talk about on the using of machine learning on uh, hydrodynamics. Thank you for the introduction, Professor Lee. And hello, everyone. Let's first start by watching this video and spend a moment on it. It's colorful and it's puzzling. And I say it's puzzling because I'm launching a lot of data at you. To be precise, it's about a gigabyte of data that I've launched. And it's nice to watch, but almost, again, impossible to process as we see it. And what if I told you that you could uncover a lot of mysteries that drive nuclear reactors if you understood this video. My lab mates and I took the plunge. We were motivated enough, so we sat and binged on these videos during the pandemic while many took to Netflix. <laughs> the pandemic has affected us all and we've been uh, thinking about it a lot. Situations may have been worse if not for the timely development and administration of vaccines. And historically, vaccines used to take several years to develop and synthesize and test multiple nucleic acid sequences before an optimal can be uh, delivered. But the COVID-19 vaccine, particularly the mRNA vaccine developed, the development happened almost a few months from the onset of the disease itself. And out of many contributors, two tech contributors have been significant. One is high-resolution experimentation, and the other was process um, was the automation of the entire process workflow itself in synthesizing and in studying our different nucleic acid chains. And these, this combination is revolutionizing the way we see uh, experiments and test uh, experiments in many fields. And that's my focus, but in the field of bubbles and boiling heat transfer. And boiling heat transfer has been of significance to us from a very long time. Come on, we've all survived this long. And we also build efficient energy systems that, that use boiling heat transfer. And I'm talking about light water reactors here. You're looking at the fuel rodlets that are cooled by, fuel, um, by fluid. And you can also observe bubbles that cool the fuel rods in uh, light water reactors. And now, thinking about formation of bubbles, let's first see what boiling is. Imagine there's a surface that gets heated, and there's fluid either flowing or it could even be stagnant, as I've shown here. As the fluid gets heated, bubbles start forming and remove heat from the surface. And that's the simplest definition of boiling that I could ever give you. And because there are multiple factors that drive the heat transferred when we start seeing bubbles. And these could range anywhere between bubble features, like the number of bubbles or the size of bubbles we form. Or it could even uh, be surface driven, like the surface roughness or the wettability of the surface. And there are, again, operating conditions that severely impact the boiling heat transferred, like the temperature or the pressure of operation. Apart from these, there is a phase in boiling that completely shatters or transforms the boiling heat transferred and makes boiling almost unusable. And that, uh, let's say, let's look back at the same video. Now, there are bubbles that you see, but let's say there's a sudden power surge that could lead to an overformation and accumulation of bubbles, and we may not be able to remove them as fast as they're formed. And that could lead to sudden and rapid temperature sp spikes, and this could be catastrophic for a reactor because it could, the fuel rod could melt or we could go into any unforeseen catastrophe, and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission lays stringent limits on the operation of nuclear reactors so as to never see the boiling crisis. So that's that's what this is, the boiling crisis, or we'll also, call, I'm gonna call it the departure from nuclear boiling as well here. And scientists have spent decades trying to zoom in to the boiling process and see what happens at the bubble level to see, to quantify the boiling heat transferred accurately and also to see what happens during the boiling crisis. And now, we have been able to accomplish that in our lab by building high-resolution diagnostics 
that my past uh, lab mates have developed. So now we have our experimental setup where we run our experiments, but we can accurately track what happens on the surface as we run experiments. So we have an infrared camera that's a high resolution camera that records all the temperature fluctuations as bubbles form and nucleate. And we also combine this with a video camera that records all the bubble interactions that we need to visualize. But again, uh, similar to vaccine development, running boiling experiments is a multi-stage process. And it also requires the, um, to build, um, so to so build um, r robust models, we need to run tests for multiple different surfaces and we have to test from uh, different conditions. So for that, we start out by fabricating a sample and that takes us about a day to complete. And once this is fabricated, we set it up into our experiment and run the whole experiment. Let's say that takes us about half a day or say one day for now. And once we've run our experiment, we acquire a lot of data that we process. So I'm not really exaggerating here when I say that it takes us a day or less than a day to run experiment, but it takes us about 30 days to process this data because the post-processing is not really straightforward and we employ a lot of different techniques and we also have to visually keep looking at bubbles and uh, quantify the process that happens. And once we have these results, we sit together and discuss uh, the implications of the experiment that we just finished to chart out the next course of experiment or fabricate a new surface or we decide the next course of action, basically. So this is the whole process that we repeat several times to um, process data and to run multiple experiments. And we run experiments on multiple different surfaces on different conditions. And we also repeat some experiments just to make sure that we get the same results every time. Here, we started thinking that there's so much of human uh, intervention that is required to set up and run our experiments and process data. And as anyone would wonder, and especially as researchers, we like discovering new theories and postulating new ideas rather than running the same experiments repetitively or being uh, monotonous. So I started thinking if we could build a tool or an assistant that would work with us on our experimental data and give us all the results that we need instantaneously, like just go from the experiment to all the uh, features that we need to determine. And even better, what if we had a tool that would take all the features that we determine and make physical inferences so that we can keep running experiments without stopping? So that was our rationale. But the data processing tool that we built should have two requirements, or satisfy two requirements, so to speak. We generate a lot of data. So from one experiment, we have over a gigabyte of data, and we aim to run at least hundreds, if not thousands, of such experiments to build models. So the tool should be able to handle big data. And the other requirement is that there are inherent patterns in bubbles uh, that nucleate and grow. If you spent a little more time, like I did with the videos on your left, you will see that there is a pattern to bubble uh, growth and nucleation, as also apparent from the bubble ECGs I've plotted on the bottom right. We can all appreciate these patterns, but we don't really have the bandwidth to process that data as we see it but some networks do. So deep networks have been, I mean, they were developed to work on big data. In fact, they work well only when they are fed big data. And uh, these can take us from our inputs to the set of outputs that we need by recognizing patterns, and that's widely acknowledged of uh, deep networks. So what we did was we ran our experiments, acquired data, and fed all of these into a network that we had already trained. And this network started making predictions of all the bubble features that we needed to determine. In fact, this, this is a bit important. If you look at it, you can um, see that the networks are able to make predictions for different surfaces and for different bubble parameters. So not only do we make predictions on um, like bubble features like the growth time or the nucleation site density, but the network does so for many multiple different conditions. And the plots you see are the neural network's performance uh, compared with our manual post-processing tool that we've used. And you can also tell that the neural network's performance is almost on par with human uh, post-processing. Let's make it a bit more interesting. I thought I'd show you how we run our experiments right now and acquire data. 
So on again, I'm not really a social blogger, so I have shaky hands. If, but if you look at the top left, you can see that that's our experimental surface over which we run experiments. You'll soon start seeing bubbles coming up. And on the bottom right are results for the bubble features that we want determined. And the pop-ups you see are, is actually the speed at which we are acquiring data and processing it. So let's say in one, two, yes, we've got data and we've processed it again. So this keeps happening, and it takes us less than two seconds to acquire and process all of our data. And most, most importantly, we also have estimates of when to expect the boiling crisis itself. So boiling experimenters will really appreciate the fact that we don't really have to be on our toes or be extra cautious for not breaking surfaces as we run experiments, because in less than a second, we might approach the boiling crisis and even break heaters. And right now, we have estimates, and we might never get there. Again, all the frameworks that we have built here have used uh, MATLAB, and we've, uh, we even manipulate all the hardware with MATLAB. This is all well and good, but we got curious. We wanted to see if we could depend on these predictions and if we could believe these predictions and take them further. So for that, we started questioning ourselves. We wanted to see if we could explain the predictions made by the networks that we have trained. For that, we chose the boiling crisis itself because that's fairly accurately predicted by the neural networks we've developed. But we wanted to see if we could correlate the boiling crisis to some of the bubble features that we also predict. So for that, we've actively monitored advancements in machine learning and in particularly in explainable artificial intelligence. So we've used some tools, I've, uh, and I will show the results for DeepShap here. So to speak about DeepShap, I want you all to think about college admissions. We've all been there and we've all seen the ad ad admission process. So let's say there's a pool of students and they have similar profiles, but one of them is chosen as opposed to the others. And we have these results now. Let's backtrack and look at what compelling factors or features that student uh, possessed that the others didn't. And now we might, able to, we might be able to um, narrow down to what um, compelling factor drove a student to get admitted um, while the others didn't. And let's translate the same idea into um, the deep networks that we are training to determine um, the boiling crisis. We did exactly that, but for deep networks, it's a multidimensional problem, and it's not as straightforward as um, as just, you know, as, as college admissions, so to speak. Um, let's look at the plot on the top right. Those are the results from our deep shop. And here we see that there are a set of features that matter the most in comparison to other features. In fact, even if we reduce some of these features, we start seeing a sharp decline in the prediction accuracy. And also, we start seeing a reduction in the feature's importance itself. And the features that we outlined as being most important are shown, at, uh, shown beneath. So this is, again, this is good, but we wanted to see if we have this hypothesis that we say you know, several factors Im impact the boiling crisis more than the others. But I started thinking, how will this uh, hypothesis break down? Or where will I start seeing discrepancies? Or when will other features start mattering to the boiling crisis? And to do that, again, We've got to run a lot more experiments to test under different conditions. And for that, I thought, why not have a tool that, if I set it up, would start running experiments on its own? Actually, that happens right now. And then have a machine learning model tell me the results and feed those results into a deep sharp explainer that would make inferences. And the system will know what decision to take. Or it might even take the experiments into uh, you know, new, new conditions or new domains that we may not have even uh, estimated. This work is, again, in progress. We have a few more months to complete it. But the application scope is broad. Not only can autonomous experimentation be used for medicine and medical research, but there's another hot topic, especially of particular interest to nuclear engineers, which is advanced material discovery that would also benefit from um, the use of autonomous experimentation. And I want to leave you with one thought on boiling experimentation. Imagine, in a few years from now, how cool it would be if a researcher or a student only had to fabricate a heater, load it into the experiment, and then they could go back home. The test section would run hundreds of experiments on its own, give inferences, and also tell you the physics. And 
in the meantime, the student could you know, dream up new ideas and come up with new theories on their own. So with that, I also want to thank MATLAB for the generous fellowship that I've benefited from. And uh, it has helped me immensely to pursue uh, and continue my research. Thank you. Thank you, Madhumita, for the wonderful presentation. So are there any questions from the audience? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So you've gone to the group, gone to great lengths to build incredible diagnostics to get a gigabyte of information in just a small experiment. And that's sort of motivated the work here where you build these tools to understand that. And I'm wondering, did the tools tell you whether all that information is important? Do you need all that information? Could you actually build similar, much more reduced experiments and get just the things that are important to learn what you need to know, or do you really need all that information? So I would say that we need all that information in the sense that when we run an experiment, we focus on a surface that gets heated and boiling starts there. So, and we also don't know where the boiling crisis might occur on the surface. So we need to capture all, I mean, all parts of the surface over which we're running the experiment. So we actually need to track. We need all that data. Yes. So I understand that the neural network um, chooses the conditions for the next experiment to maximize the relevance of that experiment. But did I hear correctly that it's also running the experimental apparatus? So now you guys are almost like you were at home and the thing was running and you were just monitoring? Okay, I think that might take a few years. Uh, but at present, what uh, when I run experiments, what I've done is I load the sample, I set up the experiment, and then I just hit the start button. Like, you know, I, I just start out um, the, on the lab view. I just I, I start out the experiment and my MATLAB code controls um, the infrared camera and yes, it, it, con it controls the whole process. So the power levels are incremented based on my MATLAB code. It's all, it's all almost automated. Definitely important to have a big dream. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. No other questions? Let's thank the speaker. Okay.